I'll stand over here so I'm not in the way of the camera. Um, so, yeah, I've had the great honor of being involved in the New Horizons mission to explore Pluto and the outer solar system for, uh, well, I started working on the project back in the 90s, so it's been a long time, um, but it's been an amazing journey and I'll tell you something about it. Um, of course, the journey started uh, 90 years ago this month um, with the discovery of Pluto. Um, and this is what the solar system looked like 100 years ago. Before Pluto was known, things were nice and tidy. You had the, the four terrestrial planets, including the Earth, very close to the sun here, and then the four giant outer planets all the way out to Neptune, all in nice flat arrangement. And Percival Lowell at Lowell Observatory in, in Arizona had a, a theory that there would be another planet beyond Neptune and thought that he had some evidence for that. Um, and he died in 1916, but he started Lowell Observatory on the path to try and find that additional planet. And uh, in 1929, they hired Clyde Tambo, um, who uh, had come from Kansas. And of course, Clyde spent most, uh, most of the late part of his life here in New Mexico. And I think he worked at the White Sands Range here, so has a strong New Mexico connection. Um, but he was hired to use this special telescope, which you can visit at Lowell Observatory um, uh, today, to search the sky for evidence of a new planet. He was looking for anything that moved that wasn't already known. Um, and he did this by just taking photographic plates, overlapping photographic plates along across the sky uh, where he thought it might be. This is a pretty large area. This is the constellation Orion here. And this is how big the plates are. And if you zoom in on just a little piece of the center of one of these plates, uh, it's, it's easy when you know where to look. Um, this is what that part of that plate looks like. Uh, just a tiny part of one of the hundreds of plates that he took. Um, and if you zoom in even further right there, you, get, you see this. Um, one of these objects is Pluto, because there's no way to tell it from a star. Um, and there's another image taken a couple of days later. And if I go between them, I don't know if you can see Pluto move, but it's not easy. So I'll make it easier. There it is. And there it is. Um, so he found that after scourging all those plates of that huge area. It's an amazing achievement. And then he continued to survey the entire sky over the next 10 years and didn't find anything else like Pluto. So it's an amazing achievement. Um, and so then the solar system went from looking like this to looking like this. And you can see how Pluto doesn't fit very well into the system of the, the planets. It's got this crazy tilted orbit. Its distance from the sun varies a lot. And uh, nobody was quite sure what to do with Pluto all these decades. Uh, but eventually, we figured out what was going on. This is what the solar system looks like now. And if I blink between them, you see all these yellow dots here are other objects out in the same part of the solar system as Pluto is. Pluto is bigger than any of those objects, but there are hundreds of thousands of smaller ones and some quite large ones. And if I show their orbits, it kind of looks like that. So uh, it's easier just to show the dots. But you can see there's this enormous swarm of objects out there. Um, and some of them are nearly as big as Pluto. Uh, this is Eris, uh, which is uh, actually more massive than, than Pluto, but a little bit smaller. It's more dense. Uh, there are several others. Several of them have moons. So there's a wide variety of objects out here. Um, this is the Earth for scale. So they're all quite a lot smaller than the Earth but they're still very substantial worlds. And this is why this new category of dwarf planets was introduced to describe these objects as being distinct from the, the, from the major planets. <coughs> um, the reason we needed a, a mission to Pluto is, is it's really small and far away and you use the Hubble telescope, uh, the most powerful telescope we have, and it looks like this. And you can't tell very much about Pluto from this. And so we really wanted to go there and see what Pluto was like up close. Um, and so we built this spacecraft. NASA funded this spacecraft in 2001. It was, this is in late 2005, just as it was being ready for launch from Cape Canaveral. You can see it's a very small spacecraft. It's about the size of a grand piano. You've got people here for scale. And um, it's bristling with instruments. There's plasma instruments. There's a telephoto camera here. It's got the lens cap on, so you can't really see it. Um, 
a color camera, an infrared instrument, an ultraviolet instrument, uh, even is measuring the radio signal to learn about Pluto's atmosphere here. Very powerful payload in a very compact package. And then we, uh, we launched it in 2006. This was an amazing thing to watch. And we have Saturn. We have a mission and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on a decade long voyage to visit the planet Pluto and then beyond. This is the largest ro rocket that NASA had at the time. It's an Atlas V um, with strap on boosters. And continues to look good as the Atlas V vehicle climbs away from Hawaii's east coast. The five solid rocket strap on boosters are burning just fine, sending the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to the very edge of our solar system. Um, so it was a very big rocket and very small spacecraft. So that meant you could get tremendous speeds, and it was the fastest spacecraft ever launched from the Earth. It crossed the orbit of the moon in only nine hours. Uh, took the Apollo astronauts three days to get to the moon. Uh, and even at that speed, it took us nine years to get to Pluto. So the solar system is a big place. Um, so this was the mission, uh, launched in January 2006. Uh, flew by Jupiter in February 2007, uh, just 13 months later, so only 13 months to Jupiter. And then an eight and a half year cruise out to Pluto where we got in 2015. And since then, we've been exploring the Kuiper Belt, this extended region of small objects um, that Pluto is part of. Um, and that's continuing to the present day. Uh, we flew, so we flew past Jupiter just 13 months after launch. Uh, this is an infrared picture of Jupiter that we took as we flew by. Jupiter was a great chance to check out our instruments and make sure everything was working and we knew how to fly the spacecraft and take science with it. Um, these are some examples looking at uh, Jupiter's volcanic moon Io that we took pictures of as we went past. Um, and it shows the capabilities of the different instruments on the spacecraft. So this is our telephoto view, and you can see a lot of detail. You see mountains here along the uh, just rising into sunlight. Here's an active volcano and a big plume of, of debris that's being ejected by the volcano. The color image isn't as sharp, but you can see the red glow of the volcano now up here. It's red lava, just like volcanoes should have. And the blue color of that uh, plume of debris that it's erupting. And then the infrared Im image shows all, lots of other volcanoes on the night side glowing, seeing the heat, seeing the heat of those volcanoes um, there. So we, we learn a lot by comparing what we see from the different instruments. And after that, we had a long cruise out to uh, Pluto, passing the orbits of Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, and finally approaching Pluto in 2015. Um, so this was a long time, but we were pretty busy during that time. We celebrated the launch every year with a cake. We ate a lot of cake. <laughs> over all those years. Uh, but more importantly, we did a lot of planning of what we were going to do when we got to Pluto. We had um, just a few hours when we're close to Pluto to take all our data. And at the speed of light, it takes four and a half hours for a signal to get from the Earth to the spacecraft and four and a half hours for a signal to get back to the Earth. So there's no way of joysticking this and doing anything real time. You have to plan the entire sequence of observations, not knowing very much about what Pluto is going to be like, and send them up to the spacecraft and pat it on the back, say, good luck, go for it. And it does its thing, and then it reports back on its results afterwards. Yeah? Did you have to make mid-course corrections? We did. In order to get to close enough to Jupiter and Pluto as, as you wanted? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we made, every, uh, we made, I can't remember, four or five course corrections along the way uh, to trim our orbit. And we take images of Pluto against the background stars or Jupiter. Uh, and we'd be doing radio signal tracking to determine our position precisely and know what kind of adjustments we had to make. And that became really crucial for the Kuiper Belt flyby that I'll talk about later. So lots of discussion and mulling over options and uh, imaginary pictures of Pluto showing what we, our scans and our pictures might look like until we came up with a pretty detailed plan of exactly what we were going to do tested it and had it ready to upload to the spacecraft. We actually did a dress rehearsal. We sent the whole sequence to the spacecraft a couple of years before we got there. And it did the entire sequence pointing in different directions, taking pictures of nothing, uh, just to make sure everything worked. Um, 
And then finally, spring 2015, we started approaching Pluto. And this was an amazingly exciting time, considering we just had that one fuzzy blob from the Hubble telescope to see before that. Pluto rotates every six days. How big was this team? The team, um, we have about 30 scientists um, with uh, junior people coming on. Uh, uh, and then there were several thousand people built the spacecraft, but actually running it, it's another 50 or 100 people. Um, and for the, the main crew is smaller than that. Um, so it's a, compared to some other missions, it's a pretty tight crew. We don't have uh, the resources that some of the more expensive missions do. Uh, but we, it, we had enough people to do the job. So Pluto's rotating every six days. Every six days, you're seeing the same face pointing at the spacecraft. But every time it's closer, and you're seeing more and more detail. So this is Pluto getting larger and larger six-day intervals and seeing more and more detail. And it's already looking pretty amazing and intriguing. We see this beautiful white heart here that we thought was really cool, that Pluto had a heart shape marking on it. Um, and then we, everybody gathered, the applied physics lab in Maryland, where this mission was run from. And this is some of the navigation team running, over, mulling over some of the navigation data. These are the guys who were responsible for steering us to Pluto, get, having us fly by at the right place, point the cameras in the right direction. Um, we had <laughs> parties. This is Alan Stern, who is the, the, the chief scientist. It's the whole mission is really his brainchild. Uh, and Glenn Fountain, the mission manager. Um, and Cheesehead hats make pretty good uh, uh, spacecraft models, if you uh, fancy them up a bit. Um, and here we are, this is one night, uh, this is about two o'clock in the morning, the night before we got to Pluto, processing the latest images that come in, the best picture of Pluto ever taken. Uh, I was up late with these guys doing this, and uh, this image was you know, tweeted by the president the next day, the one we were working on on this computer. So it was amazing to be in that kind of environment. Um, here we are seeing some of the first close-up images coming down. And Oops, I got to do that again. So, the, um, this is, so this is what Pluto looked like now once we got the full data down. Absolutely gorgeous, and absolutely gorgeous pictures. Super high resolution. And it really is an amazing place. This is part of that big white heart that we saw on approach. And you're seeing, here's a crater cut with an orange crack, a big canyon cutting through that crater that is orange for some reason. Um, this is a vast field of frozen nitrogen that is convecting. You can kind of see these patches in it. It's actually in boiling in slow motion like a soup on a stove due to the very feeble internal heat of Pluto uh, that can make it move. These are huge iceberg mountains. We think they may, they're made of ordinary water ice, and they seem to be floating in the nitrogen. Nitrogen's a little bit heavier than water ice, and so these things can float. Um, and there's all kinds of other amazing things on here. Very dark regions, of course, and these very bright regions. Um, this is a, a mountain range that seems to be made of methane and has this really <coughs> crazy snake skin kind of uh, texture on it. This is what looks like an ice volcano. It's a big mountain with a hole in the middle that we think maybe um, is some kind of eruption from the interior. More of these mountains. These mountains are the height of the Rocky Mountains. Um, here on Earth. They're really substantial mountains. Here are glaciers. This is uh, a mountains here, and you see uh, nitrogen flowing down, solid nitrogen flowing down from the mountains and out into the plains here. So um, it's a very active place. There's a lot going on on Pluto right up to the present day. Um, here, this were uh, I should have replaced this for Almagordo, but this is, I gave this talk in Albuquerque the other day. And here's one of our highest resolution pictures showing of these iceberg mountains and the, and the convecting nitrogen here. And this is compared to uh, Albuquerque on a pretty much the same, same scale. And then here is Sharon. Pluto has one big moon called Sharon. And it's also an amazing place. It has this brown polar cap which is pretty unusual. Polar caps tend to be white. We think this is material from Pluto's the atmosphere that has escaped Pluto and condensed on uh, the poles of Sharon where it's cold and has turned brown. And 
We see very rugged mountains here on Sharon as well, and a big plain here, which we think is a slurry of ammonia water mixture that has erupted onto the surface. But you see craters everywhere here. It's different from a lot of Pluto that way. And that means this surface is very old, and probably four billion years old, and it's accumulated all these impacts from other objects in the Kuiper Belt and comets and so on, blundering into it over the decade, over the millennia. Yes. If you have that much nitrogen flowing around to, to form liquid like that, is there oxygen? There's no oxygen there, um, so uh, <coughs> you'd have a hard time breathing on Pluto. But why? Why are you collecting nitrogen but no oxygen? Um, well, the Earth has oxygen in its atmosphere uh, because uh, there is life on Earth, and the plants on Earth generate that oxygen. If there was no, um, if there was no life on Earth, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, so Pluto's oxygen is wrapped up in the ice. You know, the H two O in the ice. Uh, some of it will be in the rocks in the center of Pluto, okay. but none of it makes it into the atmosphere. Um, or very little. Yes. Yeah. Does, uh, do those moons have a rotation? Because that almost looks like a crack right at the equ equatorial it's line. It's close to the equator. Mm -hmm. um, the Pluto, I could have talked more about this, but Pluto and Charon are orbiting each other every six days, and they're in, they're in lockstep. So each has the same face always pointing at the other. So they're rigidly tucked, coupled together by their tides, so they orbit like this. And uh, um, only in their history they would have probably moved apart. Sharon was probably formed by a giant impact onto Pluto, but not stuff off very much like our own moon was probably formed. And so in that process, there would have been tidal stresses and fracturing. And that might be part of this story that we think that probably happened earlier than when these fractures were formed. Our best guess for when why the fractures formed on Sharon is that there was an ocean of the liquid water inside that froze. And then like water does, it expanded. And like like pipes in the winter, the surface cracked when that expansion expansion happened. Yeah. It's just a surface crack because I mean it's so huge. Well, it, it probably goes like pretty deep. Almost like the, like it broke in half. It was yeah. So hard. They probably go pretty deep, um, maybe hundreds of kilometers into the surface. Um, that uh, you would have had a an ice uh, a, an ocean that would have frozen from the outside in. So it got cold on the surface and then froze in, and eventually the expansion of the freezing ice would have reached breaking point and that would have fractured the, the crust. That's our best theory anyway. Uh, there are four small moons as well. So Pluto has five moons in total. And we only discovered these about, started discovering them about the time the spacecraft was launched. And so this is Sharon now for scale. And uh, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra um, and this is a 10 mile scale. So we're now down to pretty small sizes. And these are chunks of ice that are probably were rejected from the system when uh, the giant impact that produced Sharon, they're leftover debris from that, but still in orbit around Pluto. Um, incidentally, the, the, the rock band sticks was quite pleased that we named a moon after them. And they came to visit and were <laughs> mentioned it in concerts. Yes. So how did, you come up with a, a name of Nix, as in Nixnay, Ixnay, Nixnay. <laughs> um, I forget the derivation, but uh, features on Pluto, a lot of them are named after characters from the underworld or right. in different mythologies. I don't and recognize Nix. I don't Nix. recognize Nix. Part of it was that Nix and Hydra were the first two to be discovered. They were discovered by our team. And N and H is, is the initials in New Horizons. So. <laughs> There was a little bit of, uh, of um, gaming the system there, um, but uh, there is a good there is a good mythological connection. I just don't remember what it is. It's a Germanic. It's in the Germanic mythology. It's a water being, half human, half fish, that lives in a beautiful underwater palace and mingles with humans. Okay, thank you. So it's German mythology. Okay. There you go. Um, and then this is one of our parting shots shots of Pluto. Wow. This is looking back. Uh, towards the sun, so you're seeing things backlit now. And I, this is everyone's favorite picture of Pluto. And it's a real picture, it's not a simulation, <coughs> nothing's been done to it. Um, and so you see this range of mountains, Rocky Mountain sized mountains, going over to the horizon, poking up on the skyline here, and the, the nitrogen glacier here. And then you see the atmosphere, this 
very thin but very deep atmosphere extending way off the picture at the top. Just uh, an amazing view and all these layers of haze in the atmosphere. How close was the camera to that? Like um, three miles or like 300 miles? <laughs> we yeah, were, so. this would probably be taken from about 15,000 miles range, oh, something wow. like that. Um, the closest we came was 12,000 kilometers, about 8,000 miles. Um, but we have pretty good telephoto cameras, so we can see these kind of, kind of views. And then as we receded further, you see the whole, and we got color images, you see the whole atmosphere is glowing blue um, from the haze, blue haze in the atmosphere. And we get this beautiful blue ring that we saw as we pulled away and this shrank down into just a dot in the sky. Um, and after that, we had more places to go. We had wanted to explore the rest of the Kuiper Belt. Pluto is currently near the inner edge of the Kuiper Belt around here. And this is Pluto's orbit. And we were going to spend the next several years and we're still exploring the Kuiper Belt out here. And what we really wanted to do is get up close to one of these little objects, one of these hundreds of thousands of little objects that are much more typical and see what those are like because we'd only discovered these 30 years ago. We didn't even know um, uh, what they were there before, before that, but we knew some of them were very primitive objects left over from the earliest formation of the solar system, pretty much undisturbed. We really wanted to see what they looked like. Um, we had one problem that uh, when we launched, we didn't know of any objects right along here. It looks from here, there's so many, you, you'd have, practically have to avoid running into them. But in fact, they're separated by millions of miles and the fuel we have on board, we can only t uh, change the trajectory by about a half a degree. And so we uh, really had to find something that's pretty much right along this line. And so we had a big search effort with giant telescopes, with giant cameras. We spent four years searching, found dozens of objects out there, but none of them was right along our trajectory that we could get to. Um, and so we went back to Hubble to find an object for us. And in 2014, only a year before we got to Pluto, we had a big effort. We took hundreds of images with Hubble to try and search for an object. And this is uh, the area we covered. Each of these is a single Hubble field of view. Hubble has superb optics, but a rather small field of view. So we had to take many dozens of images to search the area. We knew there should be something in this region here. And this is just, we're doing, this looks familiar. It's basically the same thing that Clyde Tombaugh did to look for Pluto. Uh, this is a small piece of one of those frames. And now I'm going to zoom in on a little tiny piece of this frame. And uh, you've guessed it, this is where we found our object. Um, okay, so see if you can find it. This is, we took five images. Um, and not, a lot of these are stars, a lot of them are just uh, artifacts on the camera. Um, here's the next frame and the next one. And the next one, this is easy because it's five frames, not just two like Pluto, right? I'll go back through them. Okay, and now I'll make it easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my friend Mark Bowie uh, was uh, doing the actual searching of these images. And you do a lot of searching by computer, but you then, the computer sends throws up all kinds of false positives that you have to uh, read through. And I got a call from him one Friday afternoon saying, you better come down to my office, look what I found. And it was this, and it looked real, it looked convincing, even though you can see how faint it is. And uh, we didn't know then that it was an object we could reach with the spacecraft, but we tracked it through the summer. We found several others as well and tracked those as well. It turned out this first one that we found is the one that we could actually fly the spacecraft to. And we got an email at the end of the summer from someone on the team saying, you better sit down because I've done the latest orbit update and we can, this one object is targetable. We could get there with the fuel we had. Wow. So here it is, they had provisional designation 2014 MU69. Um, and here it is right beyond Pluto, right along the, um, the path that we were following. Um, and this name is a bit of a mouthful. We had a nickname for a while, Ultima Thule, uh, but now it has an official name, which is Arakov. And this is a power term word from the Indians who lived in Maryland. And because the spacecraft was run from Maryland, we thought that was an appropriate name. It's they a, also lived in Virginia. 
Yes, that whole area, the Chesapeake area. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, so uh, that is their word for sky. And so we had a, a, a member of the tribe came for the naming ceremony, and we had a little ceremony at National NASA headquarters for the name. So now we have a proper name. Uh, we're not quite sure how to pronounce it, but <laughs> Arakath is what we are calling it. And so just a few months after the Pluto flyby, when we were about here, we fired the engines um, for, it was, took several hours of thrust, uh, thrusting to change the trajectory by just a quarter of a degree to have set us on the course for Arakath. And the flyby, just by pure coincidence, happened to be on New Year's Day uh, 2019. That's the one that um, had the snowman type shape, am yes, I correct? Yes, which I'll talk more about. Um, so then we had only three years to do what had taken us most of a decade at Pluto to plan exactly what we were going to do when we got there. This included you know, hundreds of meetings, including this was one where we were deciding what our trajectory was going to be, what side we were going to fly by, how close we were going to fly. Um, lots of discussion, lots of popcorn. Um, and we came up with a plan um, of all the observations we were going to take as we flew past. Um, and again, this had to be uh, all designed in advance and uploaded to the spacecraft and run automatically by the spacecraft. We had, um, th by this time, it was a six hour climb delay to the spacecraft and then six hours to get a signal back at the speed of light. So uh, it was even more remote than the Pluto flyby. So on, by that chart, you can only operate one camera at a time, or what? Uh, we, we, can some op we can operate two instruments at a time, but for various reasons, we can't operate all of them at once because they have to operate at different rates, and we can only send data to the storage, to onboard storage at a certain rate, and so on. There's all kinds of constraints you have to work with. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, in fact, we were taking uh, Laurie is our telephoto camera. We were taking images of that at the same time as all the other images. But the color images and the infrared, or the color and the ultraviolet, you can't do at the same time. Um, so this is something we were really worried about. Um, this is, we'd only been tracking this object for four years since we discovered it. We didn't know its orbit super precisely. Um, it's four billion miles away. We are wanting to fly by it three, well, 2,000 miles above the surface to get the best pictures we can. And um, so you have to know where its position is to within 2,000 miles when it's 4 billion miles away and you've only been tracking it for um, uh, that short period of time. In fact, you have to know it more precisely than that because your camera field of view is like looking out of a very narrow drinking straw. And there's no automatic locking onto a target if the spacecraft doesn't have that capability. So you have to tell it, point that drinking straw in this direction, and hopefully there'll be something in the picture. And so this is a simulation where that didn't work. Um, yeah. What is the speed of the spacecraft? Oh, we're going uh, 14 kilometers a second, about 35,000 miles an hour, I think. 35. 35,000 miles an hour. Um, here's a simulation where here's where it is in the simulation, and this is sort of some uncertainty as to where it might be. And we're pointing our cameras over here. This would be bad. <laughs> So we, there was a lot of work to make sure this didn't happen. Um, in August 2018, we got our first pictures from the spacecraft uh, of the object. We, until then, we'd only been tracking it with Hubble from the ground. <laughs> this is what the original picture looks like. It's just full of stars because we're looking right into the heart of the Milky Way. When you subtract out the stars, the same trick of looking for things that are moving. Here it is. The crosshairs are where it's supposed to be, and it's right there in the crosshairs. So that was really reassuring that, yeah, it's right where it is. We're right where we're supposed to be. We're heading in the right direction. Uh, but it wasn't over at that point either, because on approach, we had to continually monitor the position, make adjustments to our trajectory. Here's, we spent a lot of time looking at diagrams like this. This is the navigation team having one of their meetings. And this is Alan Stern, our chief scientist. Um, the, this is a, looking at the sky ahead of us. This box is where we need to put the spacecraft, somewhere in this box. This is, at the time of this meeting, this is various estimates about where the spacecraft actually is. And so this is telling us we're heading in the wrong direction. We have to do a trajectory correction to get the to move the spacecraft's pointing into this box. 
And but we don't know exactly where it is. It, there's various estimates that they don't agree with each other. So you have to make your best judgment as to exactly how far you have to move it to get it in the box. So that was a pretty intense process, uh, given the very limited information we had for this object. And we had to get it right. Um, the other thing we were worrying a lot about, or very interested in, is what shape this object was. Um, this is uh, my friend Mark Bowie again, uh, who discovered Arakov. Um, he had also led an expedition, which I don't have time to talk about, that had gone down to Argentina to look at the shadow of this object as it passed in front of a star. We actually bought 25 portable telescopes, shipped them down to Argentina, with, to Patagonia, with 50 people, and arrayed them along a highway in southern Patagonia in order to watch a, a given star, a particular star, blink out when the Earth's object passed in front of it, because it was only going to happen from that area. It was like a solar eclipse, where things were just lined up. And from the, the pattern of when the star blinked out, he was able to get some idea of the outline of this object. Uh, but not the three-dimensional shape, and it was a, not a complete outline. So here he is doing high-tech modeling using the modeling clay that he uh, bought the day before to try and figure out the shape. And uh, looking at various options and seeing how they would look from different angles. Um, so really, really sophisticated high-tech stuff here. <laughs> uh, and uh, here we start, we made 3D prints, and then we started looking at other possible shapes that it might be. Um, so, yeah. so of course, this is, it's a Christmas. We're, we're doing this during Christmas 2018. And we ended up under the tree we had several possible shapes and we would get to unwrap, not on Christmas Day, but New Year's Day, and see what shape it really was. Um, and it, because it was nearly Christmas, we actually took a, took a break for Christmas uh, itself. Here's the, the mission operations manager, the chief engineer, Mark Bowie again, taking a little time off on Christmas Day. Um, but then it was back to work. We only had seven days till the encounter at this point. Uh, one of the more intense things we had to do was to still associate with the navigation. The closer you are, kind of obviously, the better idea you have where the object is. So you, the best information on where to point the cameras is getting, you're getting just a couple of days before you get there. But it takes six hours at the speed of light for the pictures to get back to Earth. And then you have to do some analysis and six hours back up. So by the time you can send anything to the spacecraft, you're best part of a day later. And so this was our last opportunity to decide whether, what signals to send to the spacecraft. Um, and this happened to be at 4 o'clock in the morning, because that was just how the timing worked out with when the images were taken and came down and everything. And we've made the decision. We've decided to just update the pointing on the spacecraft. So we'll just move that drink, drinking straw just a little bit to the left. So we think things will be nicely centered in the pictures. And then we all got a very small amount of sleep before we had to get back to work. And then finally, just two days before we got there, December the 30th, 2018, we started to see it as more than just a dot. It was starting to show a shape. And here it is looking kind of elongated. The next day, now only one day before the flyby, we're starting to see where it's actually two lumps that are separated by a narrow region, um, which is kind of like some of those clay models that Mark has been making. So that was pretty exciting. But it's still not much of a picture. Yep? Is the light that's coming from the object reflected from our sun? Yes. It is. Yes. Um, and so it's a, a pretty dim source of illumination. It's uh, 40 times further from the sun than we are. Uh, so the light level is 2,000 times lower than it is in sunlight yeah. here. So <coughs> getting good pictures in that very dim lighting is challenging. That was one of the many things we had to deal with. And then it was New Year's Eve, so we had a celebration for New Year's Eve. And the fly, the actual closest approach was only half an hour after the ball dropped in Times Square. We thought about adjusting the trajectory so it was actually simultaneous with the ball dropping. <laughs> but we thought that wasn't a good use of fuel. <laughs> um, and then we, the spacecraft was doing all these things we'd, we'd uh, programmed it to do. But we, we weren't hearing from it. The spacecraft was busy taking data, not communicating with us. So the next day, um, 
after we got some sleep on January the 1st, 11 a.m., we got the signal from the spacecraft saying, it's, it's taken all the data, uh, everything worked, there were no anomalies on the spacecraft, the data recorders are full of everything. We hadn't seen any of the pictures yet, but we knew the spacecraft had done its job and we were very excited then. So here's our celebration. Um, and then the science team uh, went back to the science area to wait for the first pictures to come back, which were coming back that afternoon. And so it takes about an hour for one picture to come back uh, because of the very low data rates that we have from that far away. And the picture comes down in slices. So this is the first slice of that image coming down and showing up on the screens. And we were very excited by this because of this streak here. It doesn't look like anything, but that's the way the camera works, that you get that streak if there's something in the picture. It's a bit like a lens flare. So we knew somewhere up here in the part of the picture we hadn't seen was our object. We actually were pointed at it. It was nicely centered in the image. So we were pretty excited just to see this. And then everyone was hitting refresh on their computers trying to <laughs> see the image as it came in. And finally, someone at the back of room, at the room yelled, I've got it. And everybody piled back to sleep yeah. at his monitor. <laughs> and you can kind of see it on the screen here. Here we are again. And we, we finally had the image and it was well centered. And this is what it looked like. So our first close-up view, and it really is two objects stuck together. Um, there's even a bright region at the, in, the, in the center, which is like the Elmer's glue that's holding them together. Um, and uh, so finally, we had some clear pictures of what this object looked like. And so there was a great celebration, and we were just so thrilled that it had worked. Everything was pointed the way we wanted. Uh, this is the back of my head. Um, <laughs> And Mark was thrilled because <laughs> the actual outline looks so much like one of his models. <laughs> and so here's what it looks like. This is one of the early pictures. We got much better ones that I'll show you in a minute. But it's about 20 miles across and again has this bright color gluing the two halves together. And so then just a few days later, we were speculating, what did this mean? How do you make an object like this? We'd never seen anything like this before. Uh, but we had to be a bit more patient because that was just one image, one not very good image. And it took months to get down the rest of the data. And we're still getting down some of the data a year later. Um, and uh, so patiently, we built up a better picture. And we were able to watch it rotate as we approached. And you see these images getting sharper as we get closer. Um, but I've scaled them all so it appears the same size. And you start to get some idea of the three-dimensional shape of it from watching it spin like this. It spins about once every 15 hours. We didn't even know that till we got there. And here's our closest view uh, of the object. And you can see it's got some craters on it peppering the surface here, which means it's a pretty old surface. And when we actually look at how, how frequently things should be hitting this, it's in a very quiet backwater of the solar system where not much happens. It has to be at least 4 billion years old to have this many craters on it. And we also see there's a big crater here, and we see these funny lumpy shapes that make it seem like each of these pieces is actually built out of separate pieces stuck together. Um, we took color images as well. Um, it's this quite red color. This is taking a color image and a black and white image to combine them to get the best image we can. Um, and the two halves are very similar color, suggesting they formed from the same material in the same cloud and came together. Um, and we got stereo as well. And if anyone's good at doing the cross-eyed stereo thing, you might be able to cross your eyes and see these as a nice 3D image of the object. Um, if you can't do that, you can get some idea from this blending of the two images that um, a space enthusiast in Russia actually put together for us. Um, but this is what we think the shape looks like. So these are not two spheres glommed together, which is what we thought at first. They're actually pretty flat. And we have these two pieces that are perfectly aligned with each other when they came together. Yeah? Is it icy material? Or it, we, we think it's mostly ice. Uh, we did not see ice in the spectrum of it. We looked in the spectrum. But it is um, the surface is covered in this brown stuff that makes it a little hard to see what's underneath. Um, 
Uh, but the main thing is that these two pieces are perfectly aligned with each other. And that's telling us something important about how this thing formed. And so what we think, oh yes. Why, why is the object tumbling? Um, it's, 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 it's rotating like the Earth or most other objects do. It's got a single axis. Um, it's point, the axis is like, it's lying on its side, like the planet Uranus is, has its axis on its side, even Pluto does. And we don't know why, but it's just some random, um, probably just some random function of the orientation of the cloud that it formed from. Um, and there's a whole Four story there. years it's been tumbling. Yep. Like, no, like that with yep. basically no, no resistance. To there's no resistance. There's nothing to slow it down. It could tumble like that forever. Uh, there's no friction or anything out there. Um, so yeah, we think they probably formed like this. Um, and because this is so pristine, so undisturbed out there in the distant solar system, there's, uh, it's really telling us about how th what things were like when the solar system was forming in a way that we've never seen before. So we think there's, we know that the sun was surrounded by a disk of g dust and gas. We see those disks around other young stars. Um, and it's, this is spinning around and the gas is turbulent. It's, it has eddies in it and the dust gets caught in those eddies. And you can get enough of that dust that it starts to collapse under its own gravity. So you get these little clouds of dust that are coming together and rotating. Um, and it, eventually in the simulations, you can form two objects that are rotating around each other. And as they rotate around each other, the tidal forces on them, the gravity tides will align them with each other, kind of like Pluto and Charon, in fact, but on a much smaller scale. These things are only like 20 miles across. And then probably due to the gas that's left over in the nebula, these things gradually spiral in together and they're, they're lock, in lockstep. So when they come together, they just touch very gently. They don't d damage each other. They just then spend the rest of eternity perched on each other by their very feeble gravity. Um, so that's how we think we got what we see here. And so the, for the first time, uh, because this is such a pristine part of the solar system, we're seeing how the planets were formed, how these smaller pieces came together and stuck to produce larger objects. And something like this probably happened in the very early stages of the formation of the Earth as well. And so uh, it's a really fundamental new <coughs> result on um, how we think the, the solar system was built. So you're saying there are actually two entities they, just by force? They would together? have formed separately, uh, but in the same cloud. So they would have formed from this swirling cloud as two objects orbiting around each other and then just gradually come together. And so, would they like, if the, I don't know what the word, is, centrifugal force would stop, would they separate again? Or? Well, it's the gravity, the they're, gravity? They're, they don't have much gravity, uh, but they have enough that, that can hold them together now. So they're just gently resting on each other due so to that gravity. So they never grow together, they're just like... No, we think, we think they form, so if they'd grown together, that narrow neck would have filled in. But it hasn't. It's a still a pretty narrow neck, so they formed separately and came together. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no erosion. Uh, there's nothing really happening out there. There's, yeah. We think the top few feet might get affected by uh, cosmic rays or meteorite impacts, but there's, it's just such a empty backwater of the solar system. Nothing really is happening there. And of course, it's so far from the sun, there's not much evaporation of ices on the surface. Um, and we don't see much evidence for evaporation of ices. Yeah. What it makes me think of is, is uh, when I saw the program on the asteroids and, and sending the camera or the, the satellite up to an asteroid, and the asteroid uh, looked a lot like a peanut sort of thing, mm -hmm. too. And I just wondered if that was you know, yeah. similar. So, Asteroids, uh, small asteroids, are mostly fragments. Mm -hmm. The asteroid belt is much denser, much closer to the sun, things are moving much faster. So asteroids run into each other all the time, and they smash each other up, and they will re reform into new objects, and you get all kinds of crazy shapes that way. But you're not seeing the original shapes they had when they first formed, because things have been so messed up since then. Um, and so really you have to go this far out in the solar system where things are very quiet to see the original story. Um, so that's 
the talk except that um, just as a postscript, um, the, these encounters are fun because you get all kinds of people who are interested and you get to meet some pretty interesting people. Um, and so, yeah, we had the Rock Band Sticks came and visited us. Um, <laughs> but in addition, we had um, this guy, who is uh, Brian May, who is lead guitarist for the band Queen, who um, turns out actually has a PhD in planetary science. Wow. Um, he was working at Imperial College in London in the early 70s on his PhD, um, looking at the zodiacal light and playing guitar on the side. And then the guitar thing kind of got out of hand and he never finished his PhD. But he went back in the 2000s and went back and finished his PhD. And so he's now Dr. Brian May. So he knows a lot about planetary science. Um, but he's also been great publicity for us. He's really helped us spread the word about what the mission is doing. And he has a million Twitter followers and so on. And so it's been really fun working with him. And um, one thing that we did with him after the flyby is take uh, the series of images that we took on approach that just showed, starting with just Arakath as a little dot against the star background, then becoming this full three-dimensional world. And we did a lot of interpolation between them to get a smooth movie and then he set it to music okay. so we made this nice little music video with brian may and here it is and we're not getting the sound how come <laughs> so we uh, we had sound <laughs> We explore because we are human, but we want to know. I think we should be good now. Let's try again. Now it has to talk to the team. Ah, okay. Okay. So here it is. Because we are human. 